Today, I'm really looking forward to my meeting with Chad, Chad leader right now, Kathmandu. Hello, dear Chad. Hello, Kim. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm so excited. So, um, the people we invite stand out because they have a special radiance for the industry. They, or in this case, you, are either very innovative or different thinkers, particularly motivating or impressive by their view of things. Jed, um, we met last time on performance days and the things you shared were impressive. They were creative. They were changing people's mindset. But before we move on to our, your professional, um, let's call it lifestyle or let's call it input or whatever it is, maybe you can give us a short introduction. Who are you? What makes you tick? And please emphasize the personal, the personal milestones. Yeah. Sure. Introduce, yeah, definitely. Introduce you. yourself, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I'd say I'm, I've been in this industry um, and in the textile industry, at least for about 20, going on 25 years now. Um, but I started off in medical textiles. Um, interestingly, I've always been an outdoor person. I was a member of all of the geology and science and um, biology clubs uh, back in my school days. Um, and I always wondered how my education in industrial design uh, would apply to the things I love. Um, so uh, after being in medical textiles for a while, uh, I realized that a lot of the suppliers we had in that field um, also supplied materials for outdoor brands and sports brands. And so I took a chance, um, applied for a job in um, my home state of Ohio uh, at a design studio uh, that also did outdoor products for different clients. And from there, it's just kind of catapulted. Um, I went on to L.L. Bean in Maine, which is a, a big $2, $2 billion um, outdoor and heritage brand on the east coast of the U.S., and uh, got lucky enough to uh, befriend some folks in Germany, which took me over to Jack Wolfskin, where I was invited to run the innovation and fabric platform for them. Uh, I was there for about three years uh, when I moved on to Puma, um, or I guess as you say in Europe, Puma, right? <laughs> um, Puma, Puma. So yeah, different. Puma, Puma. Yeah. Um, was there for a year when I got a call to uh, potentially uh, take a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, uh, a role down in New Zealand. Um, and at the time, I, I really was very interested in New Zealand as a place, um, but was really also loving what I was doing at, at Puma. Um, so the hardest choice in the world really came down, and you know, you said you wanted me to get a little bit personal, um, came down to my wife and kids. My kids are native uh, English speakers, so it was a little bit difficult for them once they got into the more advanced grades in the German school system. And so the combination of uh, enabling my kids to kind of be in a, another English-speaking environment and also at a great brand, which everybody, I think, in the industry knows for as a, a very sustainable brand as well, uh, Kathmandu, um, it just kind of felt like the pieces came together at the right time. And so I took the chance and moved to New Zealand, and here I am. But um, I think the hardest thing about being down in the Southern Hemisphere is remaining connected to the industry. So um, obviously seeing you at performance days and just continually working on getting a budget to travel and to be in the places that matter most in this industry are the most important things to me. To be honest, normally the, the, the thing of the podcast is I'm prepared for, I'm super interested in personal lives. I'm like involved in outdoor industry, as you know, and in your case, I knew I, it, I knew it from the very first moment, one hour is to less. So <laughs> I tried to really focus on, um, I, I, I really focus on the moderation side. So today, this is the 26th of April in 2024, mm -hmm. we have several, um, things to tackle in the industry. We have several things to solve. We have the moments where um, lots of things on strategic planning of our work are on a somehow different field. I have no idea mm -hmm. how this relates to where we were four years ago or where we will be in four years. So, But starting with the very right question on this 26th. Of April now is um, when we started our call this morning. You said you're one moment, one month late for everything which is on your product side, forecasting, etc. So maybe we can start on something which our listeners 
would appreciate um, introduce your business expertise mm -hmm. and introduce Kathmandu, please. Sure. Uh, well, Kathmandu is actually uh, part of a group of brands called the KMD Group, uh, which also owns Oboz Footwear, O-B-O-Z, there in Montana, uh, Kathmandu itself, and Rip Curl, um, which I think most people know as the surfing brand out of Australia. Yeah, a lot of people. Uh, and it's it's actually wonderful because I've developed a lot of partnerships and friendships with, with folks at all three businesses, um, or all three por parts of our business. Uh, but yeah, so actually, Kathmandu has been around since 1989. And um, I think the main, like I said earlier, the main um, knowledge of Kathmandu in, in the global market would be their sustainability and um, just how much priority they put on um, developing the most sustainable products possible. Um, again, that being said, I think uh, the standards in New Zealand and Australia are quite different. Uh, you know, the governments I don't think are pushing as hard as other governments in Europe to incorporate, you know, mandates and, and obligations for the various brands to do, you know, C0, PFAS free uh, clothing. Um, so we take it upon ourselves to do that. And hopefully we end up leading the way and creating change, not only within the outdoor industry in the Southern Hemisphere, but also with, uh, you know, the governments and, and uh, you know, ensuring that all the brands that sell products here uh, follow the same path. I'll do some notes. Mm -hmm. For, um, let's come to all the objectives you have mm -hmm. for, for your work um, in, a, in a question later. Mm -hmm. But right now, thank you for introducing Kathmandu. Um, maybe some words on your role right now to listen on the right level for everything sure. you're saying. Yeah. So um, as the head of materials at Kathmandu, um, I basically run a lot of the um, inline or up and coming uh, seasonal material selection. So we present materials from the various mills that we work with, uh, as well as mills that we select to potentially be onboarded uh, based on the type of innovation and sustainability that they bring to the table. Um, it's a very careful selection process, and it's also in conjunction with our design and product management team. Um, you did allude uh, to the fact that we are you know, al also just now kicking off spring, summer 26. Being in the Southern Hemisphere, our seasons are a bit flipped, right? I think in some cases, uh, brands are developing in autumn, winter, while we're developing in spring, summer. Um, and part of the reason we're maybe slightly behind in our development cycle is just, I think, Obviously, we're all, and everybody in the industry right now is seeing a bit of a difficult business climate. Um, I think we all see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but what I'm hearing from the mills, um, I'm not speaking on behalf of Kathmandu, but just from an industry perspective, is that a lot of orders are delayed. A lot of inventory remains, um, you know, in the warehouses of the various brands that, um, you know, ordered things two or three seasons ago. And so hopefully we, we come out of that um, as an industry and uh, can move forward because what that does oftentimes is suspends our ability to innovate. It suspends our ability to push things forward. So for the difficult business climate, this is a wonderful description of where we are now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, sound, sounds better than a uh, lot of other descriptions where we are into. Um, Let's go back to your role because the podcast, when, when I started that one, that was during Corona, we had a lot of wish to somehow sure. speak without having all the platforms, all the trade shows, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is where it came from. And mm -hmm. seeing your um, business role right now, it would be wonderful if you share what makes you not only tick, but also special and inspiring for other. So our listeners could be business leaders, but it could also be those guys which are in the industry because they love the industry and because they they will be our future. Mm. So for the innovative part and the creative part and the structural part, when um, I did my preparations and we spoke just the the prep call, your when. Last time we met on performance day, sorry, I need to mm -hmm. underline 
what you did on performance days. That was a presentation, which is, of course, when you see all the stage presentations for a trade show, there is, this is innovation, this is sustainability, this is future, blah, blah, blah. Everything we need to take care of. But your presentation at the end of performance days was the mo one of the most visited ones. Normally, the end of the show is over. <laughs> but all your friends and all your fans were there. And you underlined the mixture of creativity structure and your own um, how you how you organize yourself. So, do you want to? Should I ask you concrete questions, or do you want to just start? Because that was so. As I said, this is something which I would did the daily structure reminds me on. Okay, this is the structure, and this is the creativity. Because everybody of us has a certain role. So maybe get all our listeners on board in your head. Mm -hmm. um, how you do your presentation to make sure this is not only the head of material, but this is how textile industry works. If it's, yeah, if it's on the good side. Sure. Um, I mean, kind of the main premise premise of the presentation was built around our understanding of the external and the internal, right? I think those were the two sort of um, main balances that we're required to achieve in our in our work. Um, and it's really easy easy to get sucked up in one of the other, right? Um, and so <laughs> I'll just, how about I just, I'll ramble a bit and then you can uh, interrupt me with any questions. But um, if I go back to slide one, if I'm thinking um, in that pragmatic way, um, it, it really was about understanding your personal, um, your personal why. And uh, by that, it's, it's, it's more of the deeper meaning uh, you have as to why you, you do this job. And I mentioned earlier that I started in medical textiles, and I know a lot of people would disagree with me, but I also know a lot of people who would still agree with me that um, outdoor uh, and even athletic and outdoor products are both, in my opinion, also health products, right? So if you look at the industry and, and what we make, you know, a lot of people say, well, we're just making clothes. Actually, we're making vessels, we're making um, objects to get people out there and to get people to be healthy. And what, what our products are, are actually preventative medicine uh, pieces rather than, again, just something fashionable. Uh, it helps when they're fashionable, but my idea really is that I'm trying to, to create a better world through the materials we choose. And so, number one, that's my main driver. My why is to get people out there, um, but also... Um, to ensure that the materials I choose uh, fit are fit for purpose, right? To make sure that the materials that, that are selected, you know, aren't going to encourage something like hypothermia or, you know, people are using these the wrong way because they simply don't understand the type of products that, that those functions are used for. Um, so once you have your why, once you know why you're motivated, um, again, it comes down to... Uh, how you serve the, the various stakeholders uh, that you work with on a daily basis. And so, Kim, I consider you somebody that I work with, right? Um, the external uh, world uh, that's outside of your own company is, is something, again, I mentioned I don't want to lose focus of. So going to the trade shows, um, seeing the different um, mills and what they offer, going not just to the sales offices of, of, these, of these suppliers, but also... Uh, to their R&D labs or potentially even talking to their ingredient suppliers. So if somebody is, you know, working with a really interesting DWR partner, invite them to the session when you're overseas or when you're, you know, when they're coming down to your facility in, in New Zealand, which surprisingly, we have a lot of mills come down to New Zealand to see us, which is awesome. <laughs> um, so that external portion uh, is actually kind of how, you know, I think I end up on podcasts and how I do different lectures because I think uh, the energy, as you said, that I, I try to convey uh, for anyone who does this job is hopefully infectious. Um, because, again, I, I think I even mentioned at Performance Days, there's a lot of other things in this industry I could do. Um, but I see materials as being one of the top two or three drivers of any business um, and so I know there's a lot of brands who don't see it that way from, you know, maybe an executive level, but that's another fun challenge is trying to convince, uh, the, you know, the executives at your companies that materials is a necessary and differentiating platform for your company. Um, that being said, and, of course, and, you're, yeah, go ahead. And, and see, seeing that, that is exactly where you, you always need a why for the base of this is where the foundation starts. And mm -hmm. if you see it as you explain it, it could only be a material. It could only be because therefore it comes on 
functionality, it comes on sustainability, it comes on usage, it comes on why why is the brand there for us? So I fully agree. I fully agree. Thank you. Just no question, just fully agree. Continue, yeah, thank please. you. <laughs> you know, and that, but that is, I mean, there's there's everybody, of course, uh, wants to feel important, and everybody has their own self interest, right? So, um, learning now, now focusing and shifting to the internal, learning how to work with those folks so that they also you know have the feeling of of self importance, and they maintain that everybody in your organization is worth, you know. Um, has a worthy cause and, and that we're all important to this big goal we have of getting people outside. Um, Kathmandu has uh, values uh, like any other brand. Of course, they have their own sort of um, values in which their, you know, their products try to, to achieve certain goals. Well, ours is joyfulness, um, you know, the joy of being outside, uh, courageousness uh, to not be afraid to try something new. Um, you know, and, and those, I think those things actually share a commonality with my own, again, my own why. Um, you know, I, I sometimes I remember 15, 20 years ago, I was afraid to do a multi-day hike. And I just jumped off, a, jumped off a plane, went to Iceland, spent four days in the wilderness and realized, oh my God, I can do this. But what that requires is courageousness. And, um, you know, sometimes you just need to build confidence and, and also read up on what it takes to do those sorts of things um, and just just try. And so, you know, in applying courageousness from a corporate standpoint, um, I think you always need a place in your line plan for, you know, may, not wouldn't say experimental products, but products that um, may not be, you know, your typical um, item that you, you know, you would expect to sell, say, like a basic uh, full zip fleece or a quarter zip fleece or something like that. No, something that's just I think shake dry is an interesting example, um, not to say anything, you know, I think just from an industry standpoint, like if you look at that out dry, shake dry, those membranes that are on the outside of a jacket, um, I know there's durability issues with that, but that's kind of an example of something that's maybe external, um, but also differentiated. Um, and I know, you know, again, on Sympatex's side, there's also things that would help differentiate a brand on the market. So those are the kind of things I look for. Again, you can't make that your entire platform. It's not going to be like what you build your brand around, but those are things that, you know, I think people take notice of and it creates a bit of a halo effect. And I, I know it's a bit cliche to say that, but that just kind of seems to be the case in the outdoor industry. Yep. I love the way you talk through the red thread of your of your head and how you tick. So if we go back to a line plan and if we see it like it, there needs to be a what did you say? Like a place in the line plan for creativity and courage and being motivated and also brave somehow. This is what you mentioned if you call it Iceland. And Iceland, I guess, is not only the four days trip, but it's like, this is a picture of what it stands for, what might have happened in that time. So maybe when um, when I may ask you, where where do you get that energy from and what can you share for all other listeners in terms of of course that was your Iceland trip on being brave but on the other hand this is a daily it, it, for my feeling it feels like okay I need an Iceland every day mm -hmm. okay. well and, and actually the, the red yeah the red thread the, the commonality between uh, you know just say like your hypothetical Iceland right is this is the scope of things um, and by that I mean it's a vast, broad, and uh, expansive landscape. And if you think of your industry in the same way, that there's so much out there, it's a massive and broad and vast landscape of materials to choose from. Um, you know, to me, that, that ties nice it all picture. together. Yeah, I mean, because <laughs> <It's like> you. <laughs> you could go down this canyon, you could go down that canyon, and there's different pathways to explore. And I, actually, this ties to my performance days lecture as well as that. Um, don't be afraid of divergent pathways. Um, you know, give yourself the time you need uh, to explore every little every little corner of um, you know the landscape that you've been given or that's been put out in front of you. So, um, you know, again, it's it's maybe too metaphorical, but the idea no, just remains no, no, that no, no, yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> if you, can... you know what? This it's exactly because of this case. Everybody who works with us or listens to us or wants to work with us mm -hmm. somewhere, whatever, is 
exactly it is not pathetic because we need these kind of pictures because that makes us tick. So if you say it might be too pathetic, that's already, again, a judgment which does not help. And this is exactly what I feel when, when we have our conversation. It's if, if you look at it on another on another view and on the, okay, where do we get our motivation from in crucial times or in strange, okay, we need to still stay at a red thread, even if there is, it was COVID some years ago, it is the war and it's the climate crisis, it, everything. And yeah, it's not pathetic at all because it's the small Iceland as a picture for everything. So um, next question, Chad, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you see, how do you, there's the, the whole, the whole thing, the Iceland, mm -hmm. how do you get it down to what you need to do every day? Uh, yes. Huh? Um, so that, <laughs> Uh, it, you know, as it alludes to, again, to my presentation, um, it comes down to the tools you have. And so having a list of, um, it's not really guidelines, it's more about just the, the ways in which you narrow things down um, is, is also quite important. So, um, you know, the tools I've used, uh, such as fabric tracking documents, um, having a materials library, um, you know, different uh training and education for those you work with. Again, because for us, um, material selection is a joint effort. Uh, and so when the designers or product managers or whoever it may be that help us um, decide on the right material in the end um, are more educated about an item and you yourself as a fabric person know why something is special, but they don't. Um, I think the education and training uh, portion of, of, a, of the tools we use is, is also quite valuable. So, yeah, I think, you know, for me, um, I just gave a presentation internally at my company about um, what we're calling technical platforms. I think I sort of alluded to them at performance days as well, but um, also having, having goals internally about how you narrow things down. So, for example, the theme of keeping you warm, right? Um, well, again, let's, let's take keep you dry, for example. Mm -hmm. Sorry, technical is in this case technical related to materials. It's nothing to do with digitalization. Uh, at at the moment, like for this topic, no. But then it it okay. bleeds obviously into digitalization. Um, and you know, essentially, when we find um, a partner who who can kind of bring both to the table, um, that's that's obviously a sweet spot. Um, we have um, different suppliers who are now sort of creating digital libraries who are uh, working on you know, 3D modeling for us to help us understand the way the garments can look even before we create our own samples. Um, that's very helpful. Um, but yeah, at the moment, you know, if we're... It, it, keeping you warm. Just stay, stay with that intro yep. for internally because I'm... Yeah. Yep. I mean, so so in a way, then we, we know, obviously, which suppliers... I was going to say keep you dry, too. We know which suppliers can help provide <laughs> solutions to keep us dry. Um, and so what we look for then is, I mean, of course, price is a consideration, but also value add. Uh, and to me, again, the only way I can convince somebody to pay for a $24 fabric versus an, a, a 10 or $11 fabric is to show the value add in that material. And um, the, the best way to do so is just to, to know what you're presenting inside and out. Um, and also to get that information from, you know, folks like you and suppliers who can really help us um, understand why the value add would work for our customers. Um, and, and there was a, a little bit of a topic before we started this uh, podcast about, you know, the education level of your consumers. Um, you know, so part of that is obviously on the consumer and in the region you live, but I think a bigger part of that is also the brands themselves. And so if we're going to tell a customer you're going to pay an extra 50 or $60 for a jacket, um, you know, it's up to us also to explain, just like we do internally, um, through our marketing and our external resources uh, as to why they would pay more for something that has a value add. So um, all of that, like forward thinking, you know, at customer, customer facing uh, perspective starts again when we're just defining our technical platforms or these categorical things of keep you dry, keep you warm, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're not thinking that far ahead, then you're really just kind of picking things off a shelf. That would lead me. So two questions, mm -hmm. two fully different red threads. One mm -hmm. is, okay, what does that lead to if we stay with consumers and retail and where is that 
thing going on right now. And the other thing, which I um, would emphasize at the moment, so I'll come back to the retail one and the consumer one later. But right now for the technology part, there is, um, and this not, not definitely not on the perspective of technical garments and this, but seeing technology-wise um, in my daily life, we focused on, as you were saying, we need a digital library, we need a digital path, we need digital material um, effects like water saving and laptop constructions mm -hmm. and everything needs to be like way, way, way more effective without sending it through the world entirely mm -hmm. all the time. How is your life now and how is it compared to before at Puma? Is there something what you, for the listeners, maybe there are a lot which are not so deep into materials like you are. Can you give a short outlook? How's the status of the industry in terms of digitalization if it comes to material? I that? think it's it's growing, but I, I think the hardest part uh, lies in the, I, I guess, the dichotomy between brand and supplier. Um, and by that, I mean the suppliers, uh, I think they're, they're only seeking this stuff out if the brands are asking for it. And the problem we have right now in the industry is that there's a certain amount of brands that are taking proactive um, digitalization steps, and there's other brands that maybe aren't prioritizing as, as much because, you know, either they're smaller, their in level of investment is not as high, or they just simply are fine doing it the way they've always done it. And, you know, for them that works. So what we have right now, I think, honestly, is a bit of a confused vendor base, um, you know, because some brands are just knocking on on doors of, of suppliers saying, you know, we need clo files, we need to see how this looks, you know, in digital form. And then, you know, we want uh, texture mapping and all of this other stuff. And then you have other brands that are just saying, well, give me 30 yards at a factory and we'll make some stuff, you know, ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as eco-friendly, but obviously there's tangibility and tactile um, reasons for doing so. So it has to be led by the brands and the, you know, obviously the big brands, um, for example, like when I was at Puma, you know, they're an $8, $8 billion brand. Um, you know, they, they were definitely investing in, uh, digital platforms to help alleviate, obviously the amount of prototypes that a brand that's $8 billion would be getting. Um, obviously that's a really proactive and, and environmentally friendly approach. Um, but at the same time, also because it, it does end up saving time, it takes lead time away from your projects. And from a materials person's perspective, it actually enables us to do what I said earlier in, in, in um, enabling divergent pathways. In other words, you can fail fast with those methods. You can say, well, that's a really interesting concept, but seeing it even digitally, uh, that let's let's move elsewhere, you know? And you can, you can essentially say, mm to through two or three different options um, because you're not waiting on multiple samples to come in to just say, yeah, this is actually something uh, that we don't need or it doesn't look as good as we thought it would on paper, if that makes sense. Yes. And yeah, I'm, 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 I, I, what am I waiting for as an answer? Because on one hand mm -hmm. it feels um, so looking at color digital or at EMIX cloud and everything, which is, which is evolving. And I, I love the concept so much on sharing knowledge and even if it then somewhere develops to KI or AI income, where, where do all this color um, developments lead? Let's, let's stay there. And on the other hand, feeling and touching. And right. as you were saying this, where, where, where is that? When you judge your role now, five years ago and in five years, can you give us an insight on your head? And your well, brain. I think if we keep it simple uh, for materials people, it's to have as, as the least amount of waste as possible, um, which is, again, the value of going to a trade show. Um, I'd like to see some sort of analysis because obviously I've never done it, but it just occurred to me two seconds ago. Uh, the carbon footprint of all of us getting on a plane and flying to a trade show and touching and feeling materials that are, you know, we can potentially even bring our designers and make a decision on the spot um, mm -hmm. to not have to go into that, you know, to the wastage of, of requiring, you know, 50 to 60 yards of sample fabric um, mm -hmm. versus, versus, uh, you know, the mills just essentially sending us uh, 
40 to 50 hangers per season, you know, you multiply that by 20 mils and you have it a ton of... It's like hell. Yeah, you have a ton of garbage, you have lab dips, you have bulk, you know, bulk uh, test fabric. So it is an interesting thing to think about, right? Like what is is more impactful? Um, you know, the fact that we can all get together, make decisions on, you know, or at least come to some decent conclusions on the spot or just get as many hangers as possible sent to us. Um, and by hangers, I mean, you know, the fabric swatches that, that for those who don't and, know materials, <laughs> the fabric swatches hangers. that come into the brands every year. Yeah. When I, when I remember that times, the, the, I'm not sure if you remember that one, but there was a brand which called Bench. And that was not only fast fashion, it was without any stuff when I worked there. So we had... Mm -hmm. um, a wonderful team which was taking care but of course the rest of the concept but seeing my role in there we had so many swatches being mm. it, it, the moment to decide was not only the color we saw it was always okay the hand feel mm -hmm. and the hand feel <laughs> felt like uh okay but the hand feel is not different than last year or tomorrow or three mm -hmm. days ago or whatever but it still feels like something being in the ingredient world from my rest of the life still something which we need to discuss so is there a digital part which is new for a new generation or is it something which is when, when you say you see digitalization and you feel it and you still have the concept of what is internal and external wise mm -hmm. so i would always see the benefit of a digitalization in this case but of course i feel if it's not feeling so yeah. where where is the future what is it um well just just, I mean, just like anything, uh, the external and the internal, just, just like finding the balance between the two of those, I think um, mm -hmm. finding, personally, I think the balance would be, uh, if I, I'm a firm believer in the show uh, circuit, the trade shows and, and being able to mm -hmm. get out there and see things, um, yeah. I think not only for, again, the tactile nature of being there, but also the interaction amongst the brands. Um, you know, having friends at, you know, Jack Wolfskin, Valde, North Face, Patagonia, having friends at all these places actually helps bring the industry together. So again, even though I kind of set that example of like, what's worse, the carbon footprint of going to a show or actually getting a million hangers, I think you can't replace face-to-face -face interaction, um, you know, um, but also I would also, I would say that if and when we decide to go to these trade shows, I think the biggest, uh, takeaway you can have is just to be selective with your materials. So instead of going to a, you know, the booth of a supplier and say, I'll take 45 different hangers, say, okay, I'll remember these ones, but I'll take home maybe six or seven, or you can send me, you know, just a half dozen or, or maybe 10 that we think are the most valuable. And then the other ones, if the, that mill offers the type of digitization that we're talking about, um, we can just kind of get an idea at the show of what the hand feel is and then digitize it or present it to the teams in a way that maybe uh, can be visualized a bit better. Because let's be honest, right? Um, when it comes to tactileness of, of fabrics, um, there are a lot of similarities. So even if you have something that's relatively similar to something that you're excited about, you can always likely find something in your library that's close. Or you, you know, you could you could get a smaller size sample or, you know, like I said, maybe that's the one of one of 10 or one of six samples that you take home from each of those mills. But I guess my point is, is the reduction of the materials you select while you're out, I think is maybe the balance that I'm looking for. Cause it used to be, I, I used to go to trade shows and just everything I saw I wanted. And then next thing you know, there's a hundred packages at my office, you know, <laughs> and I, I just, after a while, you realize that's not very sustainable and it's not very eco-friendly. So I think that's that's kind of answering my own question. That's kind of the balance I'm looking for when I do that. Um, again, just like everything in this industry requires some balance, right? And seeing when you, when you mentioned some minutes ago that there was a training, it is not only the internal training then. It's the internal and external why, because it, it for trade shows for me that's I I this is the best thing we can do because it's engaging its energy it's um, preparing and like some you know, some summarizing afterwards so you can do everything in once and this is why yeah. I loved that 
job at the trade show because you were always able to set milestones in every field of play of our sporting good industry, etc. Cetera, et cetera. But if you mention your own internal training, you do not need to have everything. Mm -hmm. You need to write, focus on the right materials. If you say go home with six and not with 2000, because the recap of the show on 2000 is way <laughs> differentiated yeah. than heavy. <laughs> and this is, this is the daily, again, this is the daily. Mm -hmm. You do not need a platform like a trade show every day because we have it in our digital world every, again every day. Yes. And yeah. Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, the, Let's face it, right? Not everybody really takes a big interest in materials, even in outdoor brands. Uh, so those in other roles, um, you know, they, they look at materials as maybe a cog in the wheel and maybe look at it a bit differently than, than you and I look at materials as being really the driving force uh, for being competitive or to, to, to you know, basically to, to, to have differentiation when compared to other companies that, that make similar products, right? Um, but I would say then, that you have to be selective with what you present. Like I said, I, I think a couple of weeks ago when I had a presentation internally at my company, I had to narrow it down to just the things that would be interesting to the group that I, I was presenting to. So mm -hmm. there's a lot more, I think, it, you know, interest mm -hmm. in, you know, the 2000 materials that I could talk about when I'm at performance days giving a talk mm -hmm. uh, versus the amount of things that I, I would get away with talking about in my own company which is, again, probably a lot less because of the technical nature of, of some of the folks that maybe don't know what we know. And combining this to, this is joyfulness. This is what you say, like the concept on keep you dry and warm and bringing everything to a point is let's try to focus on the real important things which bring the most important assets together, which is, of course, creativity, joyfulness, passion for materials or for outdoor getting people outdoor and supporting them to get outdoor, but of course also sustainability and what's next for mm -hmm. this really makes sense and leave all the rest away. And that would lead to the next question, which I already said, what's, mm -hmm. what's the next big thing for retail and consumers, et cetera. Can you give us an introduction if you see it from the material point of view that this is baseline, this is milestones. What does that lead to, lead to if you wish for what the cut do or for our industry in 26? Mm -hmm. Maybe we can stay on 25 because it's closer, but we both are already so much into sure. material. 26, sorry. Let's keep, maybe a step, step one season. Sure. So we are on 25. Well, I, I, I still find it amazing that a lot of brands uh, haven't adopted, you know, as many recycled products as they could. Um, you know, there are cases, obviously, with special fibers that you can't always get, you know, the amount of recycled material you'd like, but I think as you said, there's a baseline. And for me, the baseline is we at least need to have recycled content in our products. But um, the premise of the show, uh, Performance Days, was um, advanced recycling or things beyond the bottle. Um, so the most exciting thing for me is what does that mean, right? And, you know, me, I'm not a polymer scientist, but I mean, I always love to think about the possibilities of what could potentially be an offset uh, to the virgin material in our products and in our our plastic products or even products that are bio-based or nature-based. And so, you know, like, for example, I'll, I'll hold up like my wallet. Is there something in here that could potentially be chemically or advanced recycled into a material that could be the next big thing? Uh, you know, so when we presented the car tire fabrics uh, last year, uh, not we, but when it was, you know, brought up as a as a potential new technology, uh, the carbon capture materials, um, you know, let's keep it going. That's what I'm really interested in is, you know, mm -hmm. what's next? What can we what can we do? Because we know that a lot of the feedstock that currently is available to us in mm -hmm. in bottles, at least in the European market, will be going away. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's that's really what keeps me going. But I also want other brands to think the same way. Um, I would love it if every brand had a different take on advanced recycling and the customers were able to kind of choose what thing that they related to the most, you know? I mean, if you, you go back to my life in medical, I could say, well, hey, maybe leftover knee braces uh, or glass-filled nylon could then be the base for a piece of luggage, you know? Because um, even back then, we were trying to grind up and recycle glass-filled nylon to do something else to have a different function. Um, so again, like what's, what's your take? If you're a luggage brand, could that be something that you do? 
Um, if you're a, a brand that specializes, I would say Kathmandu's largest category is insulation. So what is it that I could fill a jacket with that's unique and cool and has a different perspective, right? Um, you know, when I was at Jack Wolfskin, they were very much a rainwear focused brand. Um, and we were always to trying to find some sort of membrane technology that was different than anybody else. Rain. Yep. So I want brands yep. to be creative enough to come up with their own sort of unique proposition for what advanced recycling could be. No. Oh. The next one would be, um, how do you see end consumers in retail? What's going on right now? Mm. What do you judge? What do you focus on? Well, you know, I, we always hear that, that sort of cliche that customers uh, say they're willing to pay for sustainability, but then they never do. Um, but I do think that we're sort of like, that's sort of actually coming to fruition now. I think the customer is recently more willing to pay for sustainability than they used to. I'm not saying it's where it needs to be or that I'm bold enough to make that as a positive statement yet. Um, but I do think that, uh, you know, I mean, there's a reason that, you know, say, for example, Patagonia is such a successful brand, but they're also their price points tend to be a bit higher than other brands. So, um, again, it's it's not a self-fulfilling prophecy yet, but I do think that at least from a retail and consumer standpoint, um, there's a lot of sameness in the market. A lot of a lot of puffers look the same as other brands. A lot of rain shells look the same as other brands. So um, I just look at myself. You know, I'm not I'm not the most wealthy customer, but I'm willing to pay for something that I love. And so I do actually think it comes down to two things. And I, I don't give enough credit uh, to design as much as I love materials, but I do think something that has a good design also creates this the sense of, well, I, I don't know why I love it, but I just do. I can't pinpoint why this thing is so great, but I just mm, wonderful love picture. it, <laughs> you know? And oftentimes, uh, and this is for my trim friends, th it comes down to things like trim. It comes down to craftsmanship and, and maybe even minimalism at times, you know? Um, so mm. yeah, in my mind, like from a customer standpoint, uh, yes, materials help it function, and if marketing gets behind it and tells the right story, I think that is still, in my personal opinion, the driving force uh, between, you know, what makes a product uh, well reviewed and what makes a product maybe not so well reviewed. But then I also have to do, I have to give credit to design and and trim and things that actually add to the product aesthetically. And um, again, just from a from an, I guess from a I don't know, a look and feel standpoint as well. I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's definitely been fabrics that I've been skeptical of uh, where maybe it's like a cotton-like hand feel. And I'm like, yeah, but that, ad that adds 20, 20 grams to the fabric weight. But the design team will tell me, trust me, you know, the customers are going to love it. And then two years later, the customers are like, more and more. We love the cotton hand feel. You know, so regardless of what my personal opinion is, and I, I mentioned this also at Performance Days, uh, you mm -hmm. can't fall in love. You can't fall in love with any one thing. Um, you have to keep an open mind to um, the suggestions of others, and especially um, those who have to collaborate with you every day on the materials that you select. Mm -hmm. Keep an open mind. Keep an open mind, and again, um, driving force for something you fall in love with. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> And driving forth to fall in love with is um is there is there anything in your in your mind if it comes to the retail landscape at the moment is there one thought what what's is there any recommendation from being on one side of the industry which is like the beginning source and the this is the foundation and two three four years later it's the person on the floor so is there anything you want to share hmm. You know, I, I did see a trend in, in the way things are retailed uh, while I was in Munich uh, a few weeks ago, and that was really the um, the assortment uh, being placed by color, which I thought was quite interesting. Uh, Pangaea does that. Norona does that. Um, you know, and if you would have told a merchandiser, you know, five, six years ago that, you know, putting a, a, a fleece next to a down jacket next to a rain shell um, on the shelf, did like, yeah, yeah. But outdoor did not. Yeah, yeah. Outdoor yeah. did not. Yeah. yeah. But in, in my outdoor industry, that's just a, a revelation for us. And, um, you know, I think 
you know, you might see brands taking cues from that in the near future, at least in the outdoor space. Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, usually it's like, this is the rainwear section of the store. This is the, the down jacket section of the store. Um, but the way we look at that is changing. And also, uh, I noticed at some, some stores as well, the, um, the, the assortment being um, planned based on storytelling. So mm -hmm. um, I won't say the brand, but there, uh, there was a store I went to where there was a timeline on the wall. And the influential products that they still sell um, that have cues to say the 1987 fleece or whatever, kind of using that timeline to sell products was also a really interesting uh, retail perspective that I thought, mm -hmm. well, you know, a brand like Kathmandu that's been around since 1989 could probably tell the same story. Um, you know, right. yeah. So, and what, what, yeah, just combining my thoughts because if it comes to the global heritage mm -hmm. and as you were saying of course it's new zealand based but this does not mean that it is something different it even even it's more it makes me curious on understanding where it come from and mm -hmm. maybe that's the same thing as you were mentioning for the brands you worked before for us as being like the german most i, I cannot be more german sometimes mm -hmm. and then <laughs> this is this affects my judging on german brands German focus press, you know what I mean? So yeah. if you have come and do as a storytelling story, hey, use it. Never. Yeah, I'm really, really pushing. Um, and it's not just me, of course, but I, we have a global global sales manager. We actually have a, a sales sales force in Europe. Um, some We have a guy in, in Germany, some folks in France, and um, I'm really pushing uh, those guys to kind of support me to Uh, push our marketing team to also talk about New Zealand. Um, you know, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that part of the reason I'm here is just because of the world-class landscape and the fact that, you know, the mountains may not be 20,000 feet high or 5,000 meters high, but um, my goodness, I've never challenged myself more uh, than when I've been here, you know, doing a lot of climbing and off off trail scrambling and just the amount of outdoor activities here. I think anybody in Europe would be um, fortunate to come experience, right? So how do I explain that experience to the customers in a global market? I always use this, this like sort of mental uh, diagram of if you're on a square where there's four shops, right? So let's say it's like a cross, a crosswalk. Um, and you have Patagonia in one corner, you have North Face in another corner, you have, um, say, Fjallraven in another another corner, and Kathmandu in the other corner, right? So a four-corner crosswalk. What is it that compels you, if you're standing in the center of the street, what is it that compels you to walk over to the Kathmandu shop? Um, you know, and I would say different brands have different reasons for uh, compelling people to come to their shop. But in my opinion, I think, um, you know, and again, I can't speak for the brand, but I, I moved to Kathmandu because of the, the stellar storytelling opportunities and New Zealand is probably one of them. I think, again, our sustainability um, initiatives w should uh, be another one. Um, and I think, it, it, you know, again, the more we educate uh, internal folks, the more we take care of our internal, the more we can excel in the external. And that includes you know, yeah. my, our reputation, my reputation in the industry, as well as the reputation that the customers see Kathmandu as having on the market. But I mean, I think if you look at Fjallraven, for example, as one corner, uh, you know, they've got the, the Konken bag. So they're, they're really well known for, for icon, an icon. icon. It's always icon. Yeah. It's exactly. an icon. Exactly. The icon. Icon basis. And Patagonia is obviously storytelling and North Face is, yeah, I think Summit Series and some of the things that they've done to create sort of a fashionable reputation for the outdoors as well. So, you know, it's it's so much fun to try to uncover what it is that makes you unique. Um, but I again, as a materials guy, maybe I'm thinking about that stuff more than I should. But also uh, my second slide of the entire presentation at Performance Days was that we are strategists and we have to be strategists as materials people. Um, because if you don't if you don't see the big picture, right? <laughs> And the, you know what, if it comes back to textile and what you were saying, how, how is the look and feel or the emotions, etc. this all comes down to exactly that moment. If you love what you do or do what you love, and this is definitely 
the material. Of course, you can do the trims and the design, and they said, "Well, this, this is a given." But if the material does the job, then yeah, that's it. So mm -hmm. uh, we're running out of time. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I would say, <laughs> like, how said. many how many times have you seen a garment where you just touch it? And you say, oh, my God, I need this garment. It feels so good. Um, you know, that's that's a material thing. Even on minimalist products, I think if you have the more minimalist the product, the more important the fabric is, right? And if you see what you were saying, where where is your time on something outdoors? I just wanted to say on the mountains, but it's, it's, it could be the waves. So if, if you have that feeling on it is it, everything is well organized as we were coming from structure strategy creativity etc so you do not need to take care of do i take this jacket that jacket, jacket blah 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 because mm -hmm. you are fine with that only one which you fall in love with mm, yes and the rest is fine you do not need to take care of because you ha anyway have to take care of so many things mm -hmm. so it's yeah, you cannot because you were saying um maybe you're taking too much thoughts on that one i think if it's not you who then so, mm -hmm. sure. I admire your work. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> for um, the end of our podcast, Chad, there are some questions where I need you to answer spontaneously. Mm -hmm. It feels as if I already know all the answers to these yeah. 10 questions because you already mentioned so much. But in comparison to our um, conversation, I would not comment. I would not. I, I just ask questions and leave the answers in the room. Are you fine for that one? And sure. Are you ready to start? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. So, oh, it, it, it's always a question because I come from the German, German is my mother tongue, and I'm not sure if this is the right translation, but I just do it. So, um, your most embarrassing business moment? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's a really, really good one, and I hesitate to bring it up uh, simply because if anyone goes to look for it, uh, they could easily find it. Um, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Uh, You're so brave. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, at the time, it seemed great because uh, I was actually featured in a an article in the Wall Street Journal about um, a technology that I was I was trying to just play with a little bit. Uh, um, at a prior brand of mine where we were, we were running, um, wearable technology or, you know, um, carbon embedded, uh, e-textiles, uh, to just do some field testing. So it was never meant to be in a commercial product. We weren't going to make 10,000 pieces with an e-textile in it. Uh, but for field testing, we thought, oh, we could measure, you know, um, the amount of friction in the shoe. We could measure how, how many steps per day these people take. And it's all basically sent to an anonymous blockchain and it's maybe 12 users, right? Um, so at the time, um, the industry thought that was pretty cool. Like, wow, this, this, this brand that's maybe not known for doing um, really technological, you know, electronic embedded uh, wearables was playing in that space. And it just completely backfired. <laughs> there was articles from Google, for, from Gizmodo, uh, from various tech magazines, I think maybe even Wired uh, did some article about how my brand was trying to track you and how we wanted to geolocate and know where you were at all times. And there was zero geolo geolocation in this device. And it was literally just a little piece of paper that went into the insole of a shoe. Um, so that experience really scared me off uh, initially. I mean, I'm back now and interested, but uh, at the time, uh, really scared me off from e-textiles. Um, and to be honest, I, I didn't ever want to touch it again. And I, I wanted to hide in a hole for weeks and weeks. And I had plenty of conversations with my HR team and my public relations team about just quit talking about the things I'm doing in my innovation platform. So that was by far the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened in my career. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, right. Um, I didn't know that. What no, and that? I, I mean, I... I, I, I and normally, I really stick on not questioning or answering these things, but this is, I didn't know that. When was that? Um, I think 2016, 2015, in that time frame, maybe 17. Um, so if anyone knows me, they'll know where that was and what time of my career it was. But um, again, you know, at the time, I have regret, regretted it, but um, 
as it stands today, I really think I was trying to pioneer something that had, had never been done before. Um, so as ashamed as I was at the time, I feel like, you know, regardless, it was just a simple fact that people didn't understand what I was trying to do. And it was my fault for not explaining it better. And that's embarrassing, right? You learn from those things. Next question. <laughs> um, your biggest surprise, Chad? Uh, my biggest surprise, I would say that a lot of, so I think certain brands have certain reputations for not being as progressive in sustainability. Um, but I've learned just by having friends at different brands, um, again, the purpose we all have and how sustainable a lot of companies are. And what that means to me is that a lot of brands that try to be as sustainable as possible just don't do a good enough job of talking about it. So I come from a world where, um, again, I used to be at a product design studio. So in a product design space, uh, marketing and self-promotion are very much part of how you succeed. Um, and it just surprised me how many brands don't talk about the, the sustainable options that they have. Um, and yeah, to me, that's that's just something that every brand should be doing. And maybe that's why they don't talk about their sustainability as much, because it should just be a given. Um, but I think, again, from a customer facing standpoint, even something as simple as this garment is 100% recycled and having that on a hang tag has an impact. And so I'd like to see that more. And it's not for the sake of greenwashing. It's just for the sake of um, basically forcing brands that maybe aren't as sustainable to uh, to take that into account and try to be more sustainable, if that makes sense. Mm. Yes, yeah. uh, your best deal. Sorry, my best what? Deal. Your best deal. 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 Could be, could be, could be, could be, whatever. Your best deal. My best deal. Um, as far as uh, materials that I've sourced and brought into my brand or products that I've purchased and couldn't believe that it was functional. Could be also on the personal. Personal could be your bike, could be your whatever, could be your personal okay. Okay. emotions, could be, could be anything. Okay, I'm with you. Um, personal, personal side maybe more than business driven side. I think I'll give you a really generic answer, and um, you're probably not going to love it. But I would say the fact that, like, when I joined the outdoor industry or just the apparel industry in general, um, the pro deals that you would get, the fact that you know you could you could attend a trade show and and you know get little waivers for forty, fifty, eighty, even you know ninety percent off certain products. Um, so it's not any one deal, I would say, but the fact that the industry mm. wants to share their products with, um, retailers and visitors, these pro deals that are, um, you know, that are out there to me is actually, it, it's, it's it actually completely influenced the way I, the way I do outdoor products, the way I hike, the way I backpack, um, and my usage, uh, I would have been scared, you know, to buy a $500 jacket, um, say from Arcteryx back in the day, because I just didn't simply have the funds for it. Um, but I love the fact that, you know, I could call someone in Arcteryx and say, hey, you know, I'd like to test your product. And maybe not anymore because I work at a competitor, but at the time uh, when I was in a product design studio, I easily could have done that. Um, so I think the generosity of the industry to just try and do whatever they can to get people out there. Um, you know, in general is, is the best deal. And Kathmandu also does this. We have a, a voucher for friends and family um, in which, you know, two or three weeks out of the year, our customers um, that we that we know, like our, again, our friends and family can just hop on over to the store and get things for 40 to 50% off. Um, and again, it's not, it's not the greatest answer in the world, but to me what that does is it introduces people to the outdoors it creates joy, it creates create courageousness, it actually enables people who may otherwise not feel like they're well equipped uh, to get out there, to get out there. And I love that. A different answer than in 45 episodes. I'm sure, I'm sure, exactly. Thank you so much for that one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, your contribution to make the world a little, little sorry, your yep. contribution to make the world a little better. Um, you know, I, so this one you probably already know, um, but I, 
I've only really worked for one massive brand. Uh, you can make a case for LL Bean as a $2 billion company. They're pretty big as well. Um, but I think the coolest thing I've experienced in my career is when um, I developed a material for some smaller brand. That material was not adopted by that brand. Again, I was. It, this was at the time where I was still falling in love with everything I developed, and I fell in love with this particular material and was so sad and upset that it didn't get adopted. And then I found out later, and that was because actually because it had a ton of sustainability, like it was 100% um, recycled from, um, you know, garment waste, and it had a cooling property to it that was nature-based and mineral-based, and I just thought it was so great. And then I found out a few months later that Nike had adopted it, and that Nike was going to talk about it in a way that was, you know, hey, this is our most sustainable cooling fabric. Um, and so I guess what I'm getting at is. Um, I'm really proud to say that regardless of whether my brand adopts something, um, oftentimes the materials that I develop get adopted in a way that influences brands that are going to give them. So I would order, you know, 10,000 yards of fabric, whereas Adidas or Nike would order two or three million dollars of fabric. Um, and that, to me, is making a big dent. Even though I don't work for those brands, I've helped actually influence and shape the industry from a sustainable perspective, just based on the fact that I made something that someone else wanted. Um, and so I don't care if you work at a, a brand with five people or a brand with, with 15,000 people, uh, you can always make a difference just by doing your best and creating the most sustainable products possible because generally mm -hmm. there's gonna be somebody who wants it. And if it is a big brand, you've made a massive impact. And so when I was at Puma, that's how I felt every day. Like everything I touch, can, Everything can, you touch is relevant. Yeah, it can have a massive impact. Yeah, exactly. Mm. No matter where it comes from. <laughs> Trying not to come. Yeah. Uh, your most reliable source could be private, could be a book, could be a movie, could be whatever. Could mm. be a person. Could be a landscape. My most, most reliable, reliable source, source is... Gosh, again, I don't want to sound like I'm generalizing, but it's the folks I know in the industry. It's you. It's, you know, it's Marco Weikert. It's, um, you know, the influencers that I rely upon um, that influence innovation and sustainability. So I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't be able to be, you know, giving lectures and having podcasts unless the right people gave me the right advice. And it's not one person, I'm sorry to say. It's it's generally the people I know well in the industry who um, give me some knowledge that maybe I didn't have before. So my most reliable sources are the ones that are in my... It touches inner... me a lot. <laughs> What's that? Oh, really? Yeah. It's... Touch, yes, of course, because this is where I do not want to comment. Uh -huh. It's the first time I don't manage, so I, I let you speak, sorry. But it no, touches it... me a lot. <laughs> it's my inner circle, you know, it's, it's, it's your inner circle. It's the group of 15 to 20 people that you can always rely on to be honest, tell you when you're wrong and give you the answer you're looking for. Even if it's not a real answer, they can at least guide you in the right direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, again, sorry to comment, but I need to, it is not the answer. It's just the space to have as is, if it is an Iceland as a picture, as you were saying, or if it is, like two or three decisions you need to make, but it's always just chat on it. Mm. Was chat. Mm. Well, I don't know if you uh, can tell, but I, I, I definitely try to stay. Like, again, I, I wouldn't be doing what I do without others. Um, I try to give credit where credit is due, and in in these cases, other people deserve the credit for. Um, I guess the energy that I have, my energy comes from from you guys, from everybody else in the industry who keeps us going. <laughs> Thank you. Same to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we feed off each other, don't we? Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is yeah. challenging every source, challenging every channel, challenging every future vision, everything in that. So um, I keep with the question and we come to an end of our podcast right now. How can people get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, the I keep it simple. Um, you know, social media for me is, is mainly relegated to LinkedIn, but I don't have any sort of hidden, um, uh, you know, uh, 
settings on my LinkedIn profile. You can you can see my email there. Um, I'll give you my email directly. It's chad, C-H-A-D, at outdoorleader.com. Um, and the coolest part about that is it's L-E-E-D-E-R, which is my last name. Um, so not outdoor L-E-A, but outdoor L-E-E-D-E-R.com. This is super smart. Uh, I, <laughs> I got lucky. You write your chat with a D or with a T? <laughs> Actually, that's even funnier because, yes, my, my email is C-H-A-D, but um, when I'm texting uh, the different vendors I work with, uh, my teams used to, to call it chatting. So instead of C-H-A-T, chatting, they would say, oh, Chad is, uh, he's chatting again with his, uh, with his vendors on his little mobile phone. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the best <laughs> ways. That's the second name, yeah. <laughs> that's very yeah. funny. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I got I fell into a, a really weird last name, but I'm pretty happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um yeah, we come to that. Is there anything you want to recommend to our listeners? Is there anything you want to say? Is there anything you want to share? Which is right now in that moment, I guess we will do some more intros. I have some ideas on mm -hmm. the inspirative business sites, what we can maybe tackle and even if it comes more to trade shows. But for now, it would be like our first podcast session together, um, which I love. I I don't want to stop, but normally I was told that the 45 minutes is something where everybody is like easy to listen for a face. Mm. So now we are a little over it. Well, time <laughs> would... flies. Time is flying. Yeah. I can't believe it's almost over. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if there's anything else to share, please do now. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's kind of cool. I, I've been kind of flipping through the presentation I gave at Performance Days as I talked, and we pretty much hit every topic um, in a in a more broad way, right? Um, but I will close this podcast with the same way in in the same way that I closed the Performance Days talk, which was um, just to be inspired. Um, make sure that you know your why um, when you get out there and you find materials. Um, Don't be the only one to evaluate. Ask others. Um, get opinions. Um, you know, you're not alone in this thing. Uh, don't be intimidated if you're at a brand that only has one or two developers or even just you alone. Uh, know that you're not alone and that we're all here to support each other and that the brands honestly need to collaborate more. Um, like I said, I've got my inner circle of friends from different brands, but I think the more people aren't scared to um, reach out to others, And to just ask the industry questions, the better off we're all going to be, right? Definitely. So let's all let's all collaborate. <laughs> Definitely. So um, even even for whatever comes, if you liked what we talk about, to all our listeners, share, inspire others, spread the word, because there's so much, so much on passion side and on creative side, and yeah, let's let's use the power we all have. Thank you, Chad, so much. Thank you.